I just had a great conversation with Abby Ramos Stanitz about literacy, uh, language, and what she teaches in grade eight. And one of the things we talked about, which I thought was really powerful, is how do we actually encourage and teach our kids to share things they're passionate about, things that they truly believe, versus things they think other people want them to say. And one of the ways Abby does this, and I think is really powerful, the way she teaches, she models it. I actually connected with Abby um, through TikTok. Uh, she, she made a TikTok uh, talking about some of the things she learned from me when she snuck into a session. We talk about that and how powerful that was. So she is a teacher. She came into an admin session I was delivering. And I was totally awesome with that. And she used that for reflection. And one of the things I've, I started following uh, Abby on TikTok after the fact and what I found really compelling and interesting about what she's doing there is she's just sharing stuff. She's doing her classroom, things she's really passionate about. And her passion really comes through, which actually makes me want to learn from her. And I think a lot of times people can kind of read that. Are you authentic in the stuff that you're sharing? Are you sharing stuff because you think somebody wants to hear what you're saying? And I, I, I love that concept. So uh, Abby and I had really great um, conversation about that. She shares a lot of really great practices. Um, and we talk about like, what is literacy today? What does that even mean? How, does, how do we evolve that? How do we get kids to really um, find different ways to share the learning? Uh, we talk about literacy mixtapes and I love mixtapes. So you might love that part of the conversation. Um, it was great to have Abby join me today. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I love this conversation. Welcome back. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I actually have today a grade eight teacher of literature, literature and is it literature and language? Is that language great? and literature? Language yeah. and literature. Okay, so it's LAL, mm -hmm. whatever yeah. it is, right? L A L. -A -L. And yeah. uh, it, her name is Abby Ramos. Stanitz. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I've been practicing. I got her, my little my little connection here. So maybe maybe I did something that you would have taught me as a teacher. To make, <laughs> yeah, see, right. it out. I, I actually uh, connected with Abby. Um, she she was at a, an event that I was speaking at. Uh, posted some reflections, which I thought was really interesting that you posted the reflections because I actually think. Um, when we share our learning uh, publicly, it actually makes it more a part of who are thinking because um, you have to kind of really kind of dissect what someone's talking about or what someone's sharing. So I, I really love that. Um, and then I saw um, some interesting, you know, conversations that followed up. And then I just been following you on TikTok ever since. Right now, I, <laughs> I'm be honest here. Uh, a lot of my TikTok is not educational. It's like exercise stuff. It's like ridiculous stuff like i i use that as my i am drained mm. uh app like i i actually don't want to like sometimes watch tiktok like teacher stuff i want to actually do the opposite but every time i see your stuff i find it really interesting and i love how you share and um just just the kind of positive uh, solutions that you find for your classroom are really interesting and in how you share that uh, so that's why I want, I asked you to be on the podcast. Cause I just think it's, it's really interesting. And you, I think you're like the first like person that I met kind of exclusively through TikTok mm -hmm. that I've had on my podcast. Now I know people have TikTok accounts, but like that's, I didn't know. I actually just followed you on Twitter, I think after that fact. So mm -hmm. Abby, if you could just tell everyone a little bit about who you are, what you do today and how you got there, I think that's a great place to start. All right. Well, um, I do teach eighth grade language and literature, um, in San Antonio, at an IB school, and I've been teaching since about 2005, always in um, language and literature. I've tried to stay entirely in Title I schools, even though I've been moved through like Houston, the Metroplex, and then now I'm in San Antonio. And I'm just trying to be the best teacher that I can be and share that so that other teachers, you know, have a little bit of an easier time and stay in the profession because I really do feel like the kids need us. And we're kind of like the last line of defense right now. So, um, I'm just trying to help. And that's kind of where my TikToks came from, just trying to share with other teachers and kind of build a community, you know, which I think is lacking right now. Yeah. And so that that actually when when I first saw you that you reflected on the, the school teacher versus classroom teacher concept. And I can talk a little bit more about what that means, but actually, what was your like that was something I talked about. And I actually talked before we got on the podcast. 
I said that the next progression of that is the global teacher, seeing mm -hmm. every student in our schools, whether we teach in that school, whether it's our district or not, as one of our students, I saw that you were really uh, exemplifying that because I know you're sharing practices with educators all over um, to, to help them do whatever they're doing. You know, I know you talk about language and literacy, but you know, there's things that you do that obviously would help if I'm a math teacher, if I'm teaching phys ed, if I'm teaching, um, you know, anything, which I found really powerful. So when you actually heard that concept, that school teacher versus classroom teacher concept, like what kind of resonated with you that you actually felt compelled, compelled to share it in the first place? Yeah. So I thought about it a lot. So I don't know if you, I wasn't even supposed to be there. I just snuck in. So I was kind of in the back listening to the Basically, I got a little backstage pass and got to hear the keynote address. So I wrote down a bunch of things and then went back to my hotel room and was li literally eating chips in this TikTok, you know, just like <laughs> literally digesting it right. Right. and figuratively digesting it at the same time. But um, I wrote it down really, really big classroom teacher versus school teacher. And um, my understanding was that a classroom teacher is someone who is pretty much only concerned with their students of record at that moment, right? right. Like, what is my job in this room? And, you know, what do I need to get done? Like X, Y, Z, that's it. Right. And then a school teacher knows that they have their kids in their room, but then they're also trying to contribute to the school in a meaningful way. So because every kid in that school is essentially my student. Right. So mm -hmm. even though I teach eighth grade language arts, how they're doing in sixth grade math is, of course, tied to my success because this is all all, they're all our students. Like the goal is not just for them to be really good at my class, but to be a well-rounded human being student who's learning everywhere. And for us all, we're all fighting the same fight basically is what mm -hmm. I think of. And so for TikTok, it just kind of made sense because, well, of course we are, we're all fighting the same battles, right? Like we all, especially coming out of the pandemic, like, you know, teachers are all dealing with the same issues. A kid in, you know, like actually I've had, you know, spoken to teachers even in like Australia that we're saying like, you know, I'm having this trouble, like struggle getting kids to read here. And we've kind of met over TikTok about that. So, I mean, her kids are just as important as the ones that are sitting in my room. And I think that we just have a way better chance of making an impact if we all work together. So that's what I got from that. I mean, I don't know if that's what you meant, but like, that's what I kind of what I took from it. Well, that I, I, I think, and I think one of the things that, um, can come out of that conversation sometimes. And especially if people just kind of hear chunks of it a little bit mm -hmm. here and there is like, you need to like put in all the effort and you need to do extracurricular and you need to yeah. do this, you do that, you need to do that. Right. And it's like, no, 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 it's not that at all. It's just kind of shifting your perspective, seeing that you actually impact outside. And there is, there is like a, um, a perfect encapsulation of this. Um, Deidre Raymer, she's a, um, I think she's deputy superintendent in West Dallas, Milwaukee, incredible leader, incredible school district. I have been there several times and I actually remember there was, um, there was a student there who had just graduated high school. It was such a, it was one of the most, and it was like one of the most validating things for this concept that I talked about, uh, when she shared this, she said that she had been thinking about suicide for basically her entire high school career. Mm -hmm. And she actually said, I'll never forget this. The thing that kept her alive was a, a high school teacher who never taught her one day ever who, who actually said hello to her every morning and greeted her by name and said that kept her alive. And it's, that's what it is. is like seeing that, you know, whether I teach this kid or not, like our interaction in the hallway. And, and I actually like kind of look back at this concept a little bit and think, where did I even start thinking about this? And I actually think it was from my own kind of bad practice, to be honest with you. I remember being really mad about doing supervision. And I remember one of my principals saying like, He's like, I know you don't like doing this. I can totally get that vibe. But can you maybe not see that this is an opportunity to actually connect kids you don't teach? Mm -hmm. And it it really, I was like, that's fair. That's like a fair thing. And I was like, it took me a little while to like get out of my grumpiness at that moment. Mm -hmm. But then I started utilizing that time. And it was like kind of interesting because it gave me like a credibility with students that maybe I didn't teach, but they were connected with students I did teach. And then, they're, then they made my life in my classroom a little bit easier and it was kind of weird. And so when I was the, the thing that actually prompted me to ask you to be on the podcast was, I distinctly remember you talking about this. Um, but then I, you were talking about, and we'll get into this in a second. Um, you were talking about this literacy mixtape idea that you, yeah, yeah. you've been using for a while. And the thing that I thought found was really interesting was in innovators mindset. I talk about, 
the notion of classroom teacher and school teacher, but actually moving to global teacher and seeing that students in our schools, like not the only the schools we teach, right? Is they're all our kids, and it's like you know when you and you said you left schools, right? And I, I have too, and you feel at that moment you're like, oh my god, like. I can't believe like I'm going to miss these kids so much. How am I going to like live without them? Like you feel yeah. that. And then you go to the new school and you're like, oh, I love these kids as well. You yeah. know what I mean? like, exactly. and you, like, you kind of move on because you know mm -hmm. that there's kids everywhere that need our support. That's right. So that to me. So when you're when you're using TikTok in that fashion to support, um, how, what have you seen as a maybe a benefit? Not only to others, but even to yourself. Like, has it helped you with your practice at all when you're Kind of sharing some of that stuff out like to help teachers and like I, i'm sure a lot of teachers have contacted you about some of the stuff that because i actually saw i actually i always kind of dig in the comments <laughs> and i talked to you about that i always dig in the comments and so <laughs> i saw people like kind of like following up with you on the idea so like how is that kind of like i said how has it helped um practice of others but also yourself oh yeah um so well, since I teach reading, like one of the first places that it started was I started with these book talks and like, um, you know, I read just a ton of ton of books throughout the year so I can talk to my kids about them, you know, that whole thing. And so um, this one TikTok creator messaged me and said, do you have a list of these books? Like, I would love to put these books in my classroom. Like, do you have a list? And I immediately said, of course I do. And so I like had a little thing and I shared it directly with them right away. And so then he went out to his community and asked for them to be you know, donated and he got like basically all the books donated. And now he has this huge multicultural library in his room that he's going to start reading and handing out to his book, like to his students. And, you know, that li literally affected his classroom right there. Mm -hmm. Well, and that just showed me right away that like, you know, I can help other people, other kids in other rooms through those teachers, you know, with whatever it is that they need help with. So like for this mixtape, I mean, I've been doing that for years. Like I said, it's a really fun assignment. I, it's really powerful for my students. And I just kind of started sharing not just that one, but lots of other things that I do to see if it's useful or helpful to anyone. And if it is, then they message and I'll message them back. They'll tell me like, are you sure you did this one right? And I'll be like, oh, thanks for checking that. I didn't need to make that more clear. There was one time I had like um, a parent letter and they were like, don't print it yet. You know, it's, it's got a misspelled word. And I'm like, oh, thank you. And I mean, that's really nice to have, especially after all these years of, um, you know, not having a community. And I do think it, there there are some moments where someone will give me some feedback in the comments and it kind of bristle a little bit like, right. oh, well, you don't know what I'm trying to do. Of course I was going to do that. And then I take a breath and I think like, you know, they're just, they're trying to make this better for my kids, you know, the way that I'm trying to share with them. And then I always thank them and say, you know, thank you for that. And let's talk about, you have this, uh, this other great idea. So um, I've really found a community there and I just want to be helpful. Right. So I'll post about things just kind of as they're going for me. There was a time I you know, had this whole first day of school lesson planned. And I started in the middle of the day. I had to change it all up because it just fell right to pieces. It was just complete crap. And so then um, a bunch of the teachers came in and said, you know, this makes me feel a lot better that sometimes I have this big idea for this lesson. Right. And then I, you know, you made me feel like it was okay to abandon it. Like, cause you're a good teacher. And I was like, yeah, but I'm not perfect. I'm not on a perfect day. So um, anyway, just a little bit. A little bit of that. Did I answer your question? I don't know. Hundred percent. I'll talk about I, this forever. Yeah, so. I, I think I think yeah. I think part of the power of that is um, using these spaces as like part, like educational, informational, like for resources, but also kind of like like support groups. Yeah, absolutely. You know, oh my God, I had a terrible day. It sucked, and kind of knowing that, like, if everyone's like, "Well, maybe you should quit." <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're yeah. not getting that, right? You're like, I'm like, well, that's not the point. Yeah. yeah. I've had those days too. And I think that, I think that, that is, um, that's really powerful. One of the things that I think is, um, really beneficial to me, cause I've been sharing my stuff forever online. I've been sharing through blogs, podcasts, this, it, it knowing that anyone can see it makes me very cognizant of what I share yeah, and very like reflective of it. Right. Um, there is a, I've shared this quote a million times. But I, I know that um, I know you'll appreciate it because of the work that you do. It's from Clive Thompson. He says, anyone can win an argument inside of their head. But when you face an audience, you have to be truly convincing. Mm -hmm. And basically, he's just saying, like, you know, when you have to put your stuff out there, you think about it more because, you know, and uh, I do this little uh, process where I get people to reflect through video. 
Um, but I actually get them to share like, hey, what did you take away from my session? And they'll be like, oh, blah, 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 blah. And, and then I'll say, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to take a video and I want you to share it. And I'm going to share it to Twitter. Mm -hmm. And you, their posture changes, their, <laughs> their, their, how clean, like how succinct they become in their response changes because they're being thoughtful. They're like, oh, wow, anyone can see this. And it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting to see that change. Um, I actually, so I don't know if this is, and this is like dating how old I am. I I saw the literacy mixtape thing. I was like, ah, oh, mixtapes. <laughs> first thing I thought, I'm like, I love mixtapes. Yeah, so I, don't know, I don't know if that was like, like I, I actually wonder a little bit because I know a lot of people are younger and they're like, literacy mixtape. That I, what's a mixtape? Like I wonder if anyone's oh, yeah. ever questions. I they have to tell that as part of the story. Like I'm like back in the day, back in the and day. I have to like back actually out like. This is a boom box and the radio would play and you had to jump over and press play and record at the same time. And the kids are like, that's rough. Like, that's tough, miss. You know, and then I'm like, I had CDs at one point and then now we're on the Spotify playlist. And I'm like, you know, what was the tone of that that you gave it to that person? But yeah, it is a little bit humbling to think of it as a historical, you know. It is an artifact. Uh, <laughs> there, there is, there, I, I, I feel there was, a, um, there was an art in, mixtapes right like, oh, for sure. like when you put a song yeah. like what's gonna end the, the gonna lead that? into the next song right you right you just, just can't yeah. just you know you just can't be all over the place and so then of course like your closure like the, that yeah. last song better be just like it better oh, be yeah. strong yeah. i actually i made a mix for um a uh, girl you know it's true i made like a <laughs> no i'm serious so like there's like a so there's a beginning of billy vanilli girl you know it's true mm. and it's like I sat back and thought about the things we used to do. And it's like this little conversation and it goes, you really mean that much to me, girl, you know, it's true. And then it starts. And it, so I actually like took that and I took like other conversations and I like mixed it in the conversation. It's like, I really mean that much to you. And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> and it's like going all over the place. And I just remember how distinct it was. You know how hard it was to like, I'd have to like time it and press the buttons and stuff like that. Yeah. So anyways, I don't want to get into like my artistry as a, you know, mixtaper. I don't yeah. know if that's what I feel like that activated a core memory for you, for sure. <laughs> oh, I, oh, yeah. I love that. I was like one of my favorite things as a kid. Um, <laughs> so like literacy mixtape, like, mm -hmm. like I know you kind of talked about it. Like, can you get a little bit more specific? Like, so I'm, can I use this at the elementary level? high school level? Like, how do you see that used at different levels and like kind of what's that process? Um, that's been really interesting to see on TikTok as well, because teachers have taken a lot of my things and just kind of made them work for their kids, you know? But right. um, so basically all that students are doing is we've studied literary devices, you know, like your simile metaphor, you know, different types of conflict, flashback, et cetera. And then um, it's uh, teaching them to look at the actual lyrics of the songs that they listen to right now. So they can't search that's, they can't like search songs with irony because then they're going to get Alanis Morissette and none of, I'm sorry, Miss Alanis, but none of that is actually ironic. And uh, so, <laughs> right, so right. they have to actually like look at yeah, easy. She's Canadian, right? I yeah. Know, sorry, I love her. I, I also, I had and love Jagged Little Pill, but that was, none of that was ironic. And so um, they have to look into the lyrics and a lot of times they'll choose, you know, like, um, any kind of songs that they're listening to. And, you know, kids today, they always have an earbud in. So yeah. I'm like, what are you listening to right now? Like, what is that? And we'll pull up the lyrics and then we'll try to find those literary devices. And then the point is to find what was the author's purpose for including them. But then they add them to a playlist that has a specific tone. So if they were, for example, making a mixtape and going to give it to someone, would that be to someone that they're like trying to hype up, somebody that they you know, are trying to romance, like a BFF mix, like right. that kind of thing. So they have to kind of do what, you know, we used to do with our mixtapes, but also <laughs> like looking at the power of the words. And it's been really interesting because they look at the music oh, and they can do this in any language also, which is really important because they'll just write me the translation. I've gotten yeah. a lot of K-pop and a lot of um, songs in Spanish, especially well, Bad Bunny, very popular this year. But um, uh, what was I going to say? They... Um, they look at the mixtape, right? And they look at their the words of the artist that they're listening to. And sometimes they'll say like, man, this person is really, really upset about, you know, what's going on in his city or his town. It's not just something I'm like hyping myself up to. I'm like, yeah, like right. these lyrics, like these artists are actually trying to, you know, get a point across what is that. 
And then at the same time, they'll be like, this person is trash that I'm listening to. They don't actually have anything to say. And right. I'm like, I guess they don't, you know? And so it's a, you know, a complex lesson that we're trying to always teach, you know, in language and literature, you know, what are the power of your words? What's the connotation? You know, what was the author's purpose for doing that? And then how would you use your own words? Mm -hmm. So it's a lot right in there. And the kids love it because they're just getting to listen to their own music, you know, and actually show me what they like at the same time. So I've also gotten some great new tunes out of it. So I bet. Hey, I actually, nice. there, there's, um, there's this, I think, I think it's called Dirty Vegas is the band. I can't remember. I'm totally, <laughs> it's called, it's called Days Go By. Okay. And there's like, it's like Days Go By. And, and it's like, a, like, a, like just a super beat, upbeat song, right? Mm -hmm. and it's like you're like you know like it was like something we used to listen in clubs and stuff yeah and somebody made an acoustic version and it's beautiful uh -huh. i was like oh this is like sad yeah <laughs> yeah right like if you yeah. actually listen to the lyrics and um the there's the harry Styles. uh oh it's like as it was and oh, yeah, like, yeah. somebody actually broke down the lyrics yeah and it was like oh me. this is kind of it's we always talk up. about um, yeah. uh, foster the people pumped up kicks. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about how like, you know, like I'll start playing it at the beginning. We talk about like verbal irony and stuff. And they're like, oh, they're, you know, this is pretty positive. And they start looking at the lyrics and like, this is about a school shooting. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, why would they? So then we kind of get into the debate of like, you know, was it wrong to use a different kind of tone or did they do that on purpose? And I mean, there's just so much to learn there. And then, of course, the dream is that one day they are at the club. And they're listening and they're like, oh, like, you know, they right. remember all of that. Right. So I find that this is a lesson that works for me even when they're out of the classroom. It's still working. Right. So I'll get messages like, I saw alliteration in this, whatever. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Well, that, they, yeah. uh, they actually, uh, one of my first years of teaching, I did, I didn't do anything like as comprehensive as this, but we <laughs> did, um, we did, uh, we had, we're supposed to do a poetry unit. I just did lyrics instead. Mm -hmm. And I've told this story before. I've actually written about it. I actually, this is like dial up internet days and I actually Canadian, I had the students like, like not even Google cause Google wasn't a thing. I had them like go on Yahoo search for bare naked ladies. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God. Like they were not, they might not find lyrics. Like this is probably yeah. not a good idea to get them searching for this. Right. And I remember yeah. like, let's just, let's just go back to poetry. I don't want to do this stuff anymore. Yeah. Like yeah. we didn't know the internet that well. Hey, so I have actually, um, not to brag, but I'm just, putting this out here and I, mm. I, I do this story so i've written i think four books now and i always make this joke that if you ask me um as a kid would you become an author i would have said you'll be lucky if i read a book after this experience because i hated reading as a kid and it was yeah. like i read great gatsby uh you know read uh lord of the flies like basically the, the high school, the yeah. 80s high school teacher playlist, right? Like that's mm -hmm. kind of what it felt Classic like. short enough to finish in six weeks. Yeah. Right. And so I just, I hated those books. Like they're, and it's not, I, and like I always say, like they're just, they're just not my jam, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you and I talked, I'm a huge basketball fan. Uh, the Jordan rules came out when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I would say, if you would have assigned me the Jordan rules, I would have read that a hundred times over and would have covered your curriculum, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the argument that I make now is, not let kids read whatever they want all the time. It's that if you give kids some opportunity to read things they're interested in, they're more likely to actually start embracing things they don't think they might be interested in. So like if you would let me read um, the Jordan rules, I might have actually ended up becoming more interested in Great Gatsby, but I was so turned off by reading. It, it actually, I can't even tell you I wouldn't have liked it. I never gave it a chance because it was like, yeah. this is going to be just like this one, just like mm -hmm. this one. So like what how what what's your what's your you know you're the expert in this right and I'm just yeah. talking from like I'm talking from my experience as a learner so like how do you how can you find that kind of balance maybe to yeah. like expose kids to stuff they might not know they're interested in but also give them the opportunity to read stuff you you totally know they'll, they'll devour yeah so that's actually kind of my jam so I um I I call it like a workshop flex kind of classroom because like you said they do get to choose everything that they read, but I also like bring them these mentor texts and I book talk and we just like right. submerge them in all kinds of different um, literature. But I make it really clear that they get to choose whatever it is that they're reading. Now, I'm there to help them as almost like a little like concierge of like, right. like, for example, you saying that you're interested in sports and it sounds like you like 
to me, there's three kinds of sports readers. And I, I did make a TikTok about this a while, a while back, but um, the first kind legitimately cares about sports and will read anything nonfiction about sports, like Friday Night Lights, you know, like Shoe Dog, you know, all of those kinds of books. They'll just read it inside and out because they want to know about sports. The second kind wants how sports relate to their life. And there are not a ton of these books out there, but, you know, there's some really good ones where like, you know, the baseball player, you know, he's really into baseball, but also he's got all these life and family issues and they kind of want it to seem gritty and realistic. There's a small group of kids that really like that. But the last group wants to read books that make them feel the way that playing sports feels, right? And let's face it, a lot of times when you're reading like a sports biography, it doesn't feel like you're playing sports, you're just getting information. So mm -hmm. what they would want was something kind of um, adventurous, something exciting, something that moves really quickly, where there's a lead character who might have like a heroic moment or you know, they have some kind of clear adversary. So what I would do in that situation is I would present pretty much all of these books to the kids and let them choose, you know, what they want to be reading at that time. Then knowing the composition of my class, because they're all reading different books at different times, I pull in a mentor text that I know has those same characteristics, something that's like exciting with maybe some kind of shout out to, you know, or an allusion to something sports driven so that I could, you know, actually have that student brought into the conversation and the next thing you know, we're doing some connections and they're open minded to, to some other things. So um, kids in my classroom generally read about 20, 25 books throughout the year. A lot of times more than that, um, even the ones that were reluctant, because I mean, I do try to just get to know them and find what right. best fits their personality and then teach them how to use it. So and and I've had some, I mean, some reluctant sports readers. So I've pushed them online to the Players Tribune. I don't know if you play. Have right. you read that? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And we'll pull that up and I'm like, let's find something to be reading in here. And they will read that like, you know, 15 minutes every class period and they can do all the assignments based on it. And they're reading a ton of nonfiction writing, which, right. are, you know, is the dream. So, well, they, um, they, they actually like the I was discouraged from mm -hmm. reading in high school. <laughs> yeah. The the actual the author um, that actually has most inspired me to write was Rick Riley. So Rick Riley wrote the back page article of Sports Illustrated. So he'd always yeah. do these sports stories, but there was like always like a human connection. Like yeah. there's like something going on, right? So it was like a one pager. Mm -hmm. And it was like it was like, oh, this is inspiring. You'd be crying. You yeah. laugh. Like it was just it was like it was interesting. It was like sports and, and humanity like mix. It wasn't like here's what happened last night in the game. It's like here's like the story behind this person and like exactly. why this is such a powerful thing. And I actually used to like rush to the library to get that Sports Illustrated. And I would try to sneak it into my classroom. Like, you can't read it because it's not real reading. Oh, my God. Like, I actually yeah. remember distinctly saying this is not real reading because that's it's a magazine, right? And missed opportunities, yeah. Right. And so, like, I, I look at that and thinking about, so I don't think that happens now. But the one thing I want to ask you about is, so you say language and literacy, right? Literature. So, Okay, language and literature. Okay, yeah. so I, so I'm gonna actually just I'm gonna, even though it's not literature. What about literacy? Like, is do you see TikTok as literacy? Like, mm. like how do you how do you see like TikTok creating media all of that as part of literacy? Because I think it's an evolving practice, right? Yeah, uh, and there, I mean, there's a lot of evolves, right. So, like, how do you see like some of the stuff that you're doing as a as a teacher sharing your learning through these different video mediums? You know. Um, throughout us doing this podcast right now, how does that maybe actually even tie into maybe some of the stuff that you're doing right now? Yeah, I'm actually glad that you you asked that because I do think that that is something that um, a lot of teachers are struggling with right now. Mm -hmm. The new literacy, like podcasts, like audio, audio, I mean, audio books, right? Yep. Um, I actually have my students create um, podcasts in a, a unit. I don't yep. actually know how to do it myself, but I don't have to. They write a script, they figure out how to do that. They have like this essential question. Um, basically, in that unit, the statement of inquiry is that fear has a positive and negative effect on society. So they have to find an international macabre story and then break it down and then make a podcast explaining what they think the point of that story was and how fear was used. Right. Well, that it is, uh, uses so many different parts of language and literature. They're speaking, they're listening, they're researching, they're writing a script. And the finished product, no, it's not a four paragraph essay, but it has just as much thinking in it. It has just as much planning. They have to be strong communicators, sometimes even stronger than when they're doing it in writing. And then same with TikTok. I've used that in the past um, as like one of my project options where students can break down 
and show me kind of what the author's purpose was or what the author's theme was through some kind of TikTok, right? And so they'll use, you know, the music, the editing, and they have to basically convince me by the end of the TikTok that, you know, here's this point of the story or whatever. And I love that because yes, they're telling me the point of the story, they're telling me the theme, but also they had to put a lot of planning into it. They had to think about how long this clip was going to be. I mean, and that's the organization and the coherence is like transfers directly to writing. So, I mean, to me, all of that is practicing literacy, right? And so we just have to embrace it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, every kid has a phone now where they're always going to be online. I'm not saying they should be all the time, right. but if we're using it in meaningful ways, then they will know how to use it in meaningful ways. Right. I mean, if you'd asked me five years ago, if I was nervous that my students would want to be a YouTuber, I probably would have said, yeah, like, I don't know about that. But now I'm thinking, you know, that's a pretty plausible career. So what skills do my kids need to be really strong YouTubers? Well, they need the planning. They need to be strong communicators. They need to know the tone of what they're communicating. I mean, all of this works really hand in hand with literacy, in my opinion. I mean, that's what I found so far. And I think it's engaging for the kids. And I mean, they they learn a lot in the process. So, I mean, it seems to be working out for me. Well, the, the so I, I love that because you're, I know, like we talked a lot about the stuff that kids are reading mm -hmm. and, but, but then to me, one of the things that's really important is what's the output, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's not just like, it's just, they're consuming information. How do they actually, you know, have an opportunity to create and share and use those, um, you know, terms explicitly. Uh, I, I, I saw, I read something the other day and I, I still struggle with this is that you see some of the really negative impacts of like social media, you know, how, like how it can be really bad. And, um, there's a teacher talking about like, you know, I used to kind of be an advocate of kids bringing their phones in the classroom and now I'm like adamantly against it. There's mm -hmm. just nothing good about it. Blah, blah, blah. Causes this issue, causes this issue. And I was like, kind of like, I, you know, depending on my day, I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, I get it. I, I don't blame that person at all. But I also think that, we're not helping anything if we don't actually kind of guide from a process of experience too, right? Like, I think that's one of the reasons I actually, you know, you to me have some, well, not have some, um, I sh would say this not with me, but I'm saying with the kids, credibility, if you're asking them to create online when you're also doing this as a teacher, do you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. like, you shouldn't be doing it. I'm like, well, do you do it? No, well, then how do you know if it's beneficial or not? You're just saying, mm -hmm. like, don't use this. And so I, like, I'm kind of like, there's days where I'm like, yeah, just take it out of their hands. I get it. <laughs> also, there's but times when they don't need it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's also, but it's also like, you're not helping anything either. And I think from this is, this is a, uh, this is going to be my last question for you or my last education related question. Anyway. Um, I do have something about the phone also. I just want to say, no, go ahead. This is like a new radical approach that I'm trying this year because like, I feel like the phones are everywhere and I like to have them sometimes when it's like scan this QR code and you can quickly do this Google right. form or, right. you know, we can use them for all these different things. Um, but I'm trying to let my kids have, I call it like a yellow zone. And I'm trying to teach them in the moment when it's appropriate for them to have their phone out because right. we're adults, like we have them, like we have it face down, like mine's right, right over here. It doesn't mean I'm taking text messages while I'm talking to you, but I also, I need to learn when it's acceptable to get it out and when it's not. And so I've tried to kind of start adding that into my like, you know, class period of like, now's a time when you need to put the phone totally away, right? Put it in the backpack because we're doing this. Or right now it can be face down on your desk. Let me, you know, right. I totally get it because they want to be connected. Their parents want to be able to reach them, especially with how, you know, nervous parents are about kids being in schools right now. Yep. They want to have that direct pipeline. Yep. And so I'll just kind of tell them like, you know, Let's learn you and I together about when our phone needs to be put away, when it needs to be out. Like, I totally get it. You got an important tech message. Do you need to step outside and respond to that? You know, and it's, you know, it's been going pretty well. I mean, there's abusers, of course, but um, I just do think that we need to teach kids how to use this technology instead of just pretending that it doesn't exist or it's going to go away. I, I, I think that what you said, what teach, I think that the, the, the solution is to most questions is to teach. Uh, yeah. I think sometimes the solution we choose is not to teach and that actually right. never has worked. Yeah, and to just expect. 
Yeah. You know, like, well, hopefully it works out for the best. Let's hope they don't screw things up. Yeah. Um, so yeah. here is, um, okay, actually, oh, I lied to you. I got, now I got two questions for you. Now, so there's going to be one about you sneaking into a session. Okay. About that one, but I'll save that one for last. Okay. The, the, um, one of the things I really admire about what, how, what you're doing on TikTok and how you're sharing stuff, I, I feel you're sharing stuff you're passionate about and you're interested in and that that actually attracts an audience of, I, I, may, I, mean, I don't want to maybe sound offensive. It's not going to attract as big an audience if you're maybe like dancing or doing ridiculous stunts. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like a big like, Hey, let's learn about literacy. TikTok. Yeah. It's like, oh, <laughs> I, I fell on literacy TikTok today, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that, that to me is, I, I feel like you still get like thousands of likes on stuff that you're sharing, which I, you know, is to me, I, I think we kind of take this for granted. Like I grew up in a town of 5,000 people total, right? And it's not like I could, and just think that people get like, hundreds of thousands of views and likes on stuff. I'm like, that's yeah. like, you know, my, I grew up in a town of 5,000 people. And so one of the things that I think is really important to me is how do we actually help our students create stuff they're passionate about and that mm -hmm. is true to them, not create stuff that they think other people want to see. And it actually takes away from who they are. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. when, it's really easy to kind of get caught up in like, oh, here's the fad. Let's jump into it because I know this will get me likes, mm -hmm. right? So this won't get me a bunch as many likes, but this is something that I'm passionate about, right? Like I talk about, I talk a lot about the same things I talked about years ago because I'm really passionate about this stuff, right? I'm not trying to like trend chase. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I, when I make my TikToks, I, you know, it would be really easy, I think, to use the music or do the same right. trend or whatever. And I've really tried to stay away from that because I feel like it takes away from what I'm trying to say. And I'm just trying to be of use to teachers. And if they're like me, they don't have time for like deciphering what the music is or watching the cute little, you know, whatever they're like, tell me, like, tell me what it is. And so um, I think that that is just being really confident in who you are. And that's where it comes back for the kids is we have to make sure that they actually believe the things that they're saying that, that, that they put out there, you know, and that's one of the things that we try to talk about with, you know, in their writing or when they post stuff or whatever, but do you actually believe that? Like, would you, if someone came for you in the comments, you know, would it make you all of, like upset or, you know, would you be able to sit there and have a conversation right. with them because you're secure in your position? And so I think that's kind of what I've just tried to stick to is, is what I'm doing of value, you know, like, do I, you know, like, am I open to ideas about this? What is the worst thing that a person could possibly say? And then, you know, to me, that might be helpful. It might be something that like, I didn't think about, right. Or they could be right. Like we could both be right at the same time and not agree. Right. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure a hundred percent how we teach that specifically, well, but I, I think, do I think you modeling is the best start. Yeah. And just being like, this is what I'm, you know, who I am, this is what I'm confident in. And I would love to sit and talk to you about it some more. And if you're posting that kind of stuff, I think you'll find an audience because people want to hear the truth, right? I mean, some of my best videos, I guess, were days when I just like popped it open right. and I was like, here's what I want to talk about right now because this is what's really happening. And people responded to that. I mean, there was one where I was completely overwhelmed with my classroom being built. I don't know if you got to see that one. Oh. And people were like offering to drive into town to help me because they were like, this is, this is real. So I think that's what people are missing right now is just that connection and just seeing who you really are I you know? yeah i don't usually do this but you got yeah. <laughs> I, love, I love that answer i okay. i actually think that social media a lot of people are saying what they think others want to hear not what they yeah. believe right and that will never end well that's mm -hmm. like, truly if you if you're saying stuff just to appease other people it's not gonna end well i, I really right. believe this okay last question so you okay. totally snuck into an admin yeah. session that i was speaking at yeah. Which I was like fine with. To be honest with you, I've said bring students, bring teachers, and I, I'll actually never say anything in an admin session. I wouldn't say to teachers, wouldn't say to parents, wouldn't say to kids. There's nothing. Well, that's what, good. What that's was good. your so 
you got to kind of see something that you maybe don't do. Did you like, we talked about the school teacher classroom teacher stuff. What was like, what was there a, maybe a takeaway from the session? What was like maybe something surprising? Like what, what kind of like, what do you remember from that? And was there anything that maybe, you know, was weird that you didn't maybe agree? I don't know, whatever. Like what was the takeaway? Yeah, it was a very different experience. I definitely felt like I had snuck in. I mean, everyone there was a principal, a superintendent, right. you know, some kind of big, you know, somebody with a much, yeah. let's just say, higher pay grade. I was, um, I was actually really impressed with how open-minded a lot of the leadership was, because there is a huge disconnect right now between the admin level and the teachers, which I know that we've talked about, like in the comments and stuff. And I know that that's happening kind of everywhere. It's not individual educators, I don't think, but there is this feeling of like the us and the them. Mm -hmm. And so um, I didn't realize how much I had actually bought into that until I sat among all these administrators. And I mean, I, like I said, I have no plans to be an administrator myself. So I'm not like, you know, yeah. trying to join the ranks or anything. Yeah. I was just kind of peeking right. behind the curtain. But um, I, I, it, Listening to the other administrators, I realized that their struggles were actually the same as ours. They felt right. blocked in to a lot of the same red tape, a lot of the same issues, and that they were actually trying to solve those problems. We just maybe at the teacher level, were not hearing that they were as much like I didn't realize they were so much on our side. Does that make sense? Like totally. I kind of thought that they were towing the line and they might believe that we do need to have 10,000, you know, like assessments so we can, you know, do all this other stuff, this red tape, but instead they just weren't complaining down to us. They were complaining up and, or fighting up in their own possible ways. And I was actually kind of taken back by how many administrators were willing to be open and to change things. And I just wondered if there was a way to get like a, the teacher viewpoint, like what's happening there is my question. Like how is the superintendent being so, um, mis, um, misunderstood at the actual teacher level, you know, like what is going on in between there is, was basically my takeaway. Um, because I think we're all on the same page. I think we're all trying to fight the same fight. Right. And in my opinion, we all have kind of the same nemesis, but like, um, we're not aligning. We're just fighting each other a little bit, right. right. Com complaining about each other. I, so I, I think that, um, I, like I, couldn't agree with you more. There, there's actually, there, this is actually quite interesting. I, I remember I was speaking to uh, a district brought me in. So I, I can actually, I'm not going to say the district, but I remember it very specifically. It was in Canada. Mm -hmm. And they had me speak to the teachers in the morning. They had me speak to the admin in the afternoon. And then they had me speak to the parents at night. I'll never forget this. And so I did the exact same talk three times. Okay. Mm -hmm. But just to different groups. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to the teachers and they're like, we love this stuff. This is so what we want to do. It's our administrators, right? They're holding okay. us back. Yeah. So then I talked to the administrators like, oh, we are like so on board with this stuff. Our teachers. <laughs> Guess what the parents said? We're so into this, but our teachers and men won't let us let our kids do yeah. this stuff. I'm like, yeah. have you have you have you ever talked to each other? Have we ever? Have yeah, ever, maybe we just had a conversation with one another because you all yeah. see on the page. But but I think sometimes, to be honest with you, I think sometimes it's really easier to blame other people for us not moving forward. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like it's like, oh, no, I, I would totally do this, but, but they won't let us. Yeah. Back, right? And I mm -hmm. like I, I saw that you know in summer some of the districts I worked at like our parents. I'm like I'm a parent. I'm like advocating for this stuff. That I want for my own kids. So you don't say parents because I am a parent. So like maybe ask, maybe have a conversation. I think for me, it's always like, like, you know, I think there is sometimes a misperception. And so that's why I ask questions. That's why I like, I try to challenge some of this stuff. And so, cause I, cause I, I I'm with you. I think we're all kind of on the same team, uh, working together, but sometimes it is a little bit of an easy way out to like, say someone else is holding us back. Mm -hmm. now, not, not, it's not always true, right? Sometimes it is people like making policies because they are super micromanagers. They want to have control mm -hmm. over everything. But I, I, I actually really appreciate that you shared that because I think um, it will be beneficial to, you know, it's kind of cool that you heard that because it is a lot of times I, I think, I think it'd be great. I think those sessions, you shouldn't have to snuck in. I think it should be <laughs> bring in, you know, teachers to get their perspectives on those admin sessions, right? Like, what did you think of what we're sharing? Right. And then you might go and like, 
hey, you know what? I was actually at this minute session. They're not as horrible as we all have been saying. Yeah. Right? Like we just had colleagues, Even right? if like every superintendent or brought three teachers with them or like, you know, and just with different sets of ears, how does this sound to you? What pops up in your mind? And then, I mean, because we're the stakeholders, we're putting, we're holding it all together. Right. I mean, I really think that we could do a lot more if we were, you know, sharing, which is kind of the whole point of the TikTok thing. I mean, yeah. I've had principals and admin post on there, like, I would love for my teachers to do this. And I'm sure that their teachers thought we'll never be able to do this, you know, like, so. Well, you know, you know, you know, Abby, if I was, if I was a principal right now, I would, you know what I'd be doing with your stuff? I'd be like, Hey, saw this awesome video from, uh, Abby, check it out. Mm -hmm. I went to do this. Here it is. And yeah. then but me actually sharing with you is kind of like, uh, saying, you know, like, Go I'm, for it. I'm kind of, I'm kind of behind this. Like we should be trying some of this stuff. So, Hey, I, I really appreciate it. It's Sunday. We're recording this. Mm -hmm. And even though it's football <laughs> Sunday and you're more a college, I'm more NFL, but I was like, I, I fall asleep the first hour of the game anyway. So I might as well record this. So I, I really appreciate your time. Cause I know, um, it's, it's hard to do this while you're busy teaching all week. And, uh, everyone, if you are listening, check out Abby's TikTok. make sure you connect with her. Uh, she has promised that in a couple of years when she becomes an administrator, she will yeah. return to the podcast. No, teacher forever. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. hey, we'll see. Well, hey, now we got it recorded. So if you ever change, now I got yeah. the Then you right. can play this part it's again. It'll be on my mixtape. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Abby, thanks so much for your time. I hope Thank you, you all for having me. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.